So this is going to be the first edition of what we're going to call the Osteopathic Lyceum podcast. So we need to get a few things out of the way. First, the title of the podcast is related to the organization that I've founded and that I'm attempting to run, which is called the Osteopathic Lyceum. Now, osteopathic ideally makes enough sense. Lyceum is a term that may make less sense to many, so we'll explain it. Now, the academy is the term that many people are used to with respect to educational institutions. The academy was Plato's school. Now, Plato being a student of Socrates, Socrates and Plato both believed it's very centrally that it was completely acceptable to have two people discuss an idea or discuss a concept in what they called a dialectic or a dialogue. So they would both people would talk, you would follow particular types of steps. So there was kind of a rigid format. And what would happen is you could come to what would be deemed an acceptable conclusion just by sharing thoughts. They essentially believed that the idea of something was the most real or the ideal thing, an idealized concept. And they, so Socrates was Plato's teacher. Plato had the academy, the academy was a school. So central to the activities of the academy was philosophizing. So just talking more than one person together, they could come to acceptable conclusions without any form of what would be considered hard evidence. Aristotle was Plato's student at the academy. So he had very high thoughts of the academy. However, when he had the opportunity to no longer take care of Alexander the Great as far as being his educator, he found a space in what was called the Lyceum, which was a general, essentially a general location that had a gymnasium, it had gardens, it had a few different things. So he rented space at what was called the Lyceum and he started what he called a peripatetic school. So the peripatetic school, what that was is to, they would walk and talk. So one of the reasons he liked the fact that the Lyceum had a garden was he could just walk around the garden, walk around the grounds and discuss things with his students. Now, one of the things that stood out about the Lyceum, as far as it being the location of Aristotle's school, was that he purposely imported as many treatises and as many written works as he could to start a library. That library was drawing on previously known knowledge, so you had it in written form. And he also had his students go out and purposely interact with primary source knowledge. So if he wanted to know anything about fishing, he would go and send his students or himself to speak to people who fished. He would get primary source knowledge, he would observe, they would then write treatises. So the thing that stood out with respect to the difference between the academy and the lyceum was that the academy, you didn't have to pay attention to anything, you just thought about it, you just remembered what you knew, and that was acceptable. The lyceum drew on previous knowledge with its library and the Lyceum also went out and consulted primary sources and essentially did experimentation. So there is a technical document that exists. I don't remember what it's called, but you can essentially see how Aristotle outlined what we would call a precursor to the scientific method as we know it. Now, that said, the reason we're using the term Lyceum for this podcast and this organization, this educational organization, is on account of the fact that we were attempting to not just stick with what is already known or philosophize about things. We're looking to do experimentation. We're looking to consult previous knowledge. We're looking to take those things, put them together, make predictions, attempt to generate experiments, attempt to grow knowledge and skills together, right? So the tagline that we're gonna use for the Osteopathic Lyceum is it's where knowledge and skills grow together. So we're not necessarily gonna stick with the orthodoxy of the Osteopathic profession, we're going to be what I would consider or what I would claim is fairly heterodox. We're not just going to listen to osteopathic thoughts and osteopathic knowledge as it stands. We're going to question, was this knowledge built in what we would consider a reasonable way? Was it built in a rigorous way? Was it built in the way that it claims it was built? Or is, are the claims of osteopathy what they say they are? Are they valid? Are they reliable? Are they trustworthy? The reason we're going to do this is because for the profession of osteopathy, which is a fairly it's fairly safe to say it's a niche profession. For it to grow in any way, it is not in its best interest to stay in its own tradition only. It's in its best interest to consider things outside of itself, to consult with other methodologies, with other knowledge bases, see where it's strong, see where it's weak, see where it can make, make itself better, see where it can learn. And that's part of what I'm going to attempt to do.
Now, in this first episode of this podcast, the thing that I'm going to consult or the thing that I'm going to talk about is the World Health Organization, or what's termed the World, World Health Organization document for benchmarks in osteopathic training. I'm going to tell you why it's not necessarily a World Health Organization document. And there are some in the profession that would like to use this as, as a standardized document, as a document to gain credibility from. And I'm going to tell you why that's probably not a good idea and why the document isn't what it says it is. So first I'm gonna tell you what the document does well. The document is a it's kind of central feature where many people within a lot of organizations were able to contribute information and say some things, have their say. It set forth a general outline. So if you are looking for something to point to for credibility, you can say, I do those things then fair enough. So what it did was it consulted a bunch of people within the osteopathic profession. Now, the majority of the people that it consulted are not necessarily education experts. They're content experts. So they are, they may be experts in osteopathy or they may be experts in administration. So if you look at the list on the document, you'll see a bunch of names from varying osteopathic schools, from varying osteopathic organizations across the world. And you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find any of them that have accreditation or knowledge with respect to actual delivery of education doesn't mean they're not educators it means that they're content experts and that they have the profession of osteopathy has survived with content experts it has reproduced itself with content experts it hasn't necessarily reproduced itself with the best evidence with respect to educating healthcare professionals the reason that i can say this is because i have gone out and i've purposely found information through obtaining my master's of science in health science education from McMaster University. Does that mean I'm the foremost expert in education? No, not at all. But it means I have knowledge of how education would be ideally delivered to healthcare professionals that others in the profession may not have. I can't prove that they don't have it, but I can, you know, on the sniff test, I can say they probably don't have the information that I have. Again, it's not to say that I'm better, that I'm worse, that I'm anything. It's to say that I have particular pieces of information that other people probably don't have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hopefully make all of this work properly because I can share things through this platform. So you can see, and I'll make my window a little bit bigger here, put it up to the side. So you'll see that we have benchmarks for training in osteopathy right? The, this is part of a larger project, which was benchmarks for training in traditional complementary and alternative medicine. So traditional medicine is one thing. So you'll see TM or you'll see CAM, complementary and alternative medicine. Now you see the World Health Organization seal on it, right? And then you see, as you go down, World Health Organization seal, World Health Organization 2010, right? But when you get into the forward, so just before we pass through that, you see the contents, acknowledgements, forward, preface, the base principles of osteopathy, so that outlines, this comes from the content experts. These are things that you will find in the glossary, glossary of osteopathic terminology. You'll find this in Foundations of Osteo Osteopathic Medicine, which is a textbook. You'll find it in varying places. This is what they got from the content experts within the field of osteopathy. You'll see tra training of osteopathic practitioners. So you see categories, core competencies, benchmark training, curriculum, uh, adaptation of type one, type two programs. So that's telling you either somebody has previous training in the healthcare profession or they don't. Safety issues, contraindications direct to direct techniques and then indirect fluid balancing and reflex-based techniques. That's actually a place where this document shines. It is a nice standardized location to pull quickly some lists of contraindications. It's actually really good at that. Then it has its reference, right? So the consultation of osteopathy in Milan, Italy, 28th, 26th to 28th of February, 27th. Now this, it, the list of participants here, so what you can see is that this happened in particular locations, the 26th to 20th of February, that would have been a conference, right? So there was a conference. Documents come out of conferences in the scientific world quite often, and often they're quite useful. It doesn't mean they all are always fantastic, but it means that it's common, right? So when we get into the foreword, right? So you see the, the acknowledgements, WHO greatly appreciates the financial and technical support provided by the regional government of Lombardy, Italy for development and publication of basic training documents as part of the implementation of collaborative projects with the WHO in the field of traditional medicine. Regional government of Lombardy kindly hosted and provided financial support for the WHO consultation in osteopathy held in Milan, Italy in February 2007. So what you're seeing is that this is a specific government in Italy funding something on behalf of the WHO. So really, this is 
you can argue that this is more WHO, you can argue that this is more go regional government of Lombardy, but either way, this is in a very specific context and context matters. So in varying parts of the world, the Oscar profession is allowed to do more things or less things, depending on the laws and regulations of the jurisdiction. And that's going to come up a little bit later. So one of the things I'm going to say is that if you're considering places in the world where osteopathy can do a bunch of things, where it can read images, interpret it, medical imaging, where it can make diagnoses. What you're doing is you're ignoring the fact that a lot of places can't do those things. So you're better to set up a standard that actually doesn't include those things. Where the legal framework allows for an osteopathic practitioner to make some form of diagnosis or interpret medical imaging, that will be an, a, an addendum or an add-on in that jurisdiction because it's allowed. But that is not something that should be part of a benchmark because there are places that are just not allowed. I happen to live in Ontario. In Ontario, osteopathic practitioners can do no form of diagnosing. They can do no form of medical image interpretation. Now, they should understand medical imaging reports because it will allow them to understand what they should not do with a patient when that report is present, but it doesn't mean that they should be able to interpret it. All right, so you see that this is not necessarily only the WHO, this is also the regional government of Lombardy, and that those contextual elements may skew this towards those jurisdictions where osteopathic practitioners can do more things, where as opposed to the absolute core of the osteopathic profession. So it would be more ideal to benchmark the core of the osteopathic profession as opposed to where, every, where people can do everything. All right, you get down into the forward, and you'll see that this is very gen fairly general. So TM, CAM, uh, those considerations have, so I'll be in here, I'll highlight this. Uh, these considerations have guided the work of the regional government of Lombardy in TM slash CAM, which was first included in the regional health plan in 2002-2004. Clinical and observational studies in the region of Lombardy have provided crucial step, a crucial step in the evaluation of TM slash CAM. With the help of data from these studies, a series of governmental provisions has been used to create a framework for the protection of consumers and providers. The cornerstone of this process was the first memorandum of understanding for the quadrennial court cooperation plan, which was signed between the regional government of Lombardy and the World Health Organization. The, so you can see that it was actually Lombardy that started this process, and then they decided to upload this to the WHO. The MOU highlighted the need for certain criteria to be met, including the rational use of TM slash CAM by consumers, good practice, quality, safety, and the promotion of clinical and observational studies of traditional medicine slash complementary alternative medicine. When they were published in 2004, the WHO WHO guidelines for developing consumer information on proper use of traditional complementary and alternative medicine were incorporated into the first MOU. So you can see that, again, this was the government of Lombardy trying to protect its citizens. It was doing something for its citizens and the practitioners that would be interacting with the citizens. This is not necessarily a project that the WHO set forth. So the, this then imports more context from Lombardy than it does from Ontario, than it does from France, than it does from the UK, than it does from Australia, than it does from New Zealand, than it does from Spain. This is contextual. So there is some challenges with that context as far as benchmarking. They're benchmarking for Lombardy. They're not benchmarking for Canada. They're not benchmarking for New Brunswick. They're not benchmarking for British Columbia. That's not what happened here. So to use this for the world is not necessarily an intelligent thing because the benchmarks are not the core of the profession. They are a lot of things that the core of the profession doesn't require. So we go down a little farther. This is just a long thing about the rest of the process. So not necessarily osteopathy on its, on its own, but others as well, right? And then this goes into some rationale. So the, the preface goes into some rationale for why they are trying to benchmark traditional medicine, complementary alternative medicine training standards <clears throat> around the world. So the regional government of Lombardy is trying to rationalize why they're doing this and good for them. You might as well have some standards. The problem with the standards that they're setting forth is that they're benchmarked for Lombardy. They're not benchmarked for the rest of the world. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Don't need to go through all of that. The drafting consultation process basically says that uh, they had some, they went to content experts. That's pretty much what it says. First stage of drafting the series of documents uh, was delegated to the national authority. So they went to administrators, administrators of health uh, and those organizations in national locations. These drafts were then in the second stage distributed to more than 300 reviewers in more than 140 countries. 
right? So it's just telling you how it went through it. So it picked content experts to look at this and the content expert says, oh yeah, this passes the sniff test, this is fantastic, we like this, right? It didn't necessarily ask any education experts because if it asked education experts, there are some hallmarks that at the time this was produced would not necessarily have been included. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Scroll down a little bit. It uh, gives you a background on osteopathy, not necessary for our purposes. The basic principles of osteopathy. So this goes into the human being is dynamic unit of fun, uh, function, dynamic functional unit whose state of health is influenced by the body, mind, and spirit. So that's a triune. Uh, body possesses a self regulatory mechanism and is naturally self healing. Structure and function are inter interrelated at all levels of the human body. Now, this is interesting because this doesn't necessarily match the four principles of osteopathy, which is the uh, uh, structure and function interrelated on all, all level, body self-healing and self-regulating. The, I can't remember the third one. It's not coming to my head. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so the body is a fully integrated unit, body, mind, spirit, body self-healing and self-regulating. Uh, structure and function are interrelated at all levels. Those are the three. And then what I call the cop-out, rational treatment is based on the above principles. That's what you'll find in the foundations of osteopathic medicine. That's what you'll find as a standard in almost all osteopathic programs. It's not here, right? So something that would be considered standard isn't listed as it would normally be listed. It's listed in a different way here. So that's a diversion, right? Then what it's going to do is tell you about the models of osteopathy. So structure function relationship, biomechanical structure function, respiratory circulatory model, neurological model, biopsychosocial, and bioenergetic. Those you're going to find in the foundations of osteopathic medicine. So you can see again, this is where it comes from content experts. Most of these models, if anybody from any profession, uh, say academic profession, if anybody from physiology came across this, if anybody from anatomy came across this and looked at the writings that are associated with each one of these models, they probably would disagree. The level of evidence for these things is very, very low, and it doesn't necessarily match findings from other investigative methods. What these models do is they allow for cognitive processing and cognitive interpretation of motion dysfunction findings. All osteopathic assessment methods are inherently based on motion. So that motion which can either be palpated or seen. There are some claims about palpation that may go beyond what really they should say. That's not what we're going to discuss right now. But these models are not supported in their claims by evidence in any strong way. But what they do allow for is a standard form of cognitive processing. So you can think more about bones and muscles and ligaments. You can think more about uh, the mechanics. So the arthroidal mechanics, you can think about more so about how fluid flows through the body, about how the respiratory cycle generates uh, changes in pressure. So it essentially creates a vacuum dynamic. You can talk about that. That's all fair and good, but the things that are associated underneath it and the claims that are made are weak, but these are standard. So being standard doesn't necessarily mean they're good, but it means they're standard. This allows you to speak across the world with osteopathic practitioners if you understand these pieces of information. So those you'll find from content experts. This is just a straight scab, uh, a straight pull from something like Foundations of Osteopathic Medicine. Nice blank page. Then you get the training, right? So this is where they're going to talk about the categories, the type one and the type two, the type one being people with previous training in a healthcare profession, type two being somebody who has nothing. They differentiate that because they do recognize that at least in varying parts of the world, you'll have both types of programs because they already exist. So this is also a game of catch up. This already exists. This is what we're going to tell you, you should do. So it's going to outline the content, the method, the who, uh, the who, who the training is provided to to and by whom the roles and responsibilities of the future practitioner, level of education required in order to undertake the training. Uh, and that's really just the type one, type two. So the type one, you should have a previous healthcare background, the type two, whatever you have in that region that they're willing to accept you into the program because they should be starting you from absolute scratch is the claim. They say that the type two training, oh, sorry, I'm mixing it up. The type one is the no prior healthcare. The type two is prior healthcare. So please excuse me. I've made a mistake on that. Switch everything I've said. Type one training programs. These programs. So this is what I want to read. Ah, 
let me highlight it properly. These programs typically, not necessarily, typically are four-year full-time programs, supervised clinical training and appropriate osteopathic, osteopathic clinical facilities and essential component and students may be required to complete a thesis or project, right? So that's just a suggestion. It's not a necess necessity. There's no body that is enforcing this. This is what they're suggesting. It's not necessary. They say they think it's good. So it's not a standard. It's a suggestion. That's true of this whole program, right? The, here, this is another thing. The reason I say it's content experts and not educational experts is because you see here, experts in osteopathy consider that acquiring appropriate mastery of osteopathy to be able to practice as a primary contact healthcare professional independently or as members of a healthcare team in various settings requires time. A typical type, a typical, not this must happen. Typically this happens. Uh, type one program would take 4,200 hours, including at least a thousand hours of supervised clinical practice and training. That doesn't mean in clinic. It means supervised practice and training and clinical would essentially mean learning how to interface with a patient's body, how to assess it and how to treat it, getting feedback on those things, not necessarily being thrown into a clinic and saying go and having some supervision for safety and no feedback on what you're doing. It means that somebody's actually there interfacing with you, making sure that you know how to do it, making sure that you get feedback. That's important. So that may happen in a lot of places already. That may not happen. But again, these are typical. Other academic curricular content may be delivered by various staff in various training formats. Training may be full-time, part-time, or a combination of the two. So they're fairly agnostic about how the education is delivered, which is why you'll see programs that do have online for the cognitive skills or for the academic side, and then in-person for the hands-on. You'll see variations here. Uh, the core competencies, strong foundation, osteopathic history, philosophy, and approach to healthcare. Fine enough, might as well know those things. Understanding of the basic sciences within the context of the philosophy of osteop osteopathy and the five models of structure and function. So what that says is we're going to try to teach you science, but we're going to try to relate it. So we're going to try to overlay those cognitive models of structure function. So uh, bioenergetic, biopsychosocial, uh, biomechanical, so on and so forth, circulatory, respiratory. They're just going to say, do this. So this is what the science says, but put it in here. So it allows, again, for that cognitive discussion, that cognitive processing to occur. Ability to form appropriate differential diagnosis and treatment plan, that's ideal, but you have to understand that in a lot of jurisdictions, you can't form an actual diagnosis. You can form an osteopathic diagnosis, which is essentially this moves, this doesn't move. This moves as expected, this does not move as expected. What you really should be able to do is identify major red flags. It's like, wow, this is a really big problem. I should not treat this. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I should send it out for referral. That's very important. That is something that this document's good at as you go later into it. Uh, the uh, ability, an understanding of the mechanisms of action of manufactured interventions and the biochemical, cellular, and gross anatomical response to therapy. This is actually a place that is highly contested. The Evidence that is compiling in multiple directions is unclear and uncertain. So anybody, any educational program that says these are the mechanisms of how osteopathy works or how any manual therapy works are on a very shaky ground. So this is something that I would say you should include, but you should be extremely careful with. You should not be in any way certain when teaching people. You should say these are the things that people seem to think and support, but we're not 100% sure. The ability to appraise Oh, so ability, yeah. ability to appraise medical and scientific literature critically and incorporate relative, relevant information to clinical practice. Great idea. I don't see much of that happening. I, in the interactions that I have with the profession at large, I see people cherry picking a lot saying, this is, what, this is a piece of science that says what I do is awesome. This is a piece of science that says what I do is awesome, but we don't agree. So I don't necessarily see that happening well in the profession, even if it is something that's occurring at the educational level competency and palpatory and clinical skills necessary to diagnose dysfunction in the aforementioned systems and tissues of the body with emphasis on osteopathic diagnosis. Fantastic, right? I think that should be there. Competency in a broad range of skills of OMT, that is redundant with the previous one, so that can be taken out. Proficiency in physical examination and interpretation of relevant tests and data, including diagnostic imaging and laboratory reports. So what I would say is Understanding diagnostic imaging and laboratory results is important, but interpretation of them should not necessarily be a core competency because that is not allowed in many jurisdictions. Understanding the biomechanics of the human body, including but not limited to, oh, sorry, proficiency in physical examination, 
redundant with the previous ones, redundant with competency and palpatory and clinical skills. That doesn't need to be a competency, right? So you can get rid of a bunch of this. This is wordy for nothing. Understanding of the biomechanics of the human body, including but not limited to the articular, fascial, muscular, and fluid systems of the extremities, spine, head, and pelvis, blah, blah, blah. Anatomy. You need to know functional anatomy. So again, wordy for nothing, just teach functional anatomy. You could leave it at that, and most people would interpret it appropriately. Expertise in the diagnosis and, uh, and OMT of neuromusculoskeletal disorders, redundant again, no OMT. Uh, thorough knowledge of the indications for contraindications to osteopathic treatment. Very important. This document's good at it. Basic knowledge of commonly used traditional medicine, complementary alternative medicine techniques. Fair enough, you should know what other people are doing, right? The benchmark training curriculum, the basic science, and then the history and philosophy of science. This is actually a pet peeve of mine. The philosophy of science, although they suggest that you should talk about it, I see no mention of epistemology, ontology, or axiology within the osteopathic profession, aside from one paper, which was in the Australian context, which was looking at the epistemic cultures or the knowledge building cultures of both Chinese medicine and osteopathy. It was a very small sample, but it's a constructivist thing. So even me using these terms, I'm going to talk about these as we go through this process and this podcast arc, but those terms are not there. The philosophy of science is absolutely lacking in osteopathy. No matter what people have tried to show me, osteopathic practitioners are very weak with respect to the absolute fundamentals of science. Uh, and we would do, we would be very well served to do much better with that. The fundamental bacteriology, blah, 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 blah. No anatomy, no physiology in a very broad sense. These are just a bunch of headings, right? It doesn't tell you how to do these things, practical skills, obtaining and using an age-appropriate history. Fantastic, right? This would be included in most things. You wouldn't necessarily have to do it, but this is what they take for telling you how to develop a program or develop a curriculum. These are headings, right? So some headings, general synthesis of basic laboratory and imaging data, clinical problem solving and reasoning, understanding relevant research and its integration into practice. These are headlines. These don't instruct an educator as to how to build a curriculum. This is why I'm suggesting that this is not a standard document. This is not a document with any teeth, but because it says WHO, many will use it to say these are standards. This is a non-instructive document with respect to how to develop a curriculum or a good understanding of what the core competencies of the osteopathic profession are, regardless of context, because it's including the context where people can do everything or as much as would be legally allowable in the most free jurisdiction. This is not indicative of what the profession throughout the world can do. The uh, blah blah blah, yeah, uh, the then what you get is this big long breakdown of contact hours. Now, this is where this document falls absolutely short. Contact hours do not suggest in any way competence because you get 150 hours of anatomy, doesn't mean in any way that you know anatomy. The assumption that would be included with this is that you're going to get tested in anatomy and you're going to pass that test, but it's going to be one summative test or two or three summative tests. And by summative, it means they are informing decisions as to pass or fail in a cumulative grade. Then they're usually paper tests. They're, they're only one type of test. They're just knowledge tests. Uh, healthcare studies and other healthcare systems, five hours. Principles of, and philosophy of osteopathy, 100 hours, right? The, what you're hoping for is to identify competency in these domains. Contact hours do not relate to competency. Competency is provable ability to do something that you say you can do. So if you say you can diagnose a patient as far as motion dysfunction is concerned, you should be able to show that on multiple forms of assessment. And multiple assessors should be able to agree. So there's this concept called competency-based medical edu education or competency by design. It's been around for a long time. It was known about when this document was created. And these, this process did not include competency at all. Now, competency is not necessarily about the content of the curriculum. It's about the assessment methods. It's usually going to use a large and varied amount of assessment methods. It's not just one, it's many assessment methods to prove competency. There's a term that's related to this, and we'll go through this in a subsequent podcast, but they're called entrustable professional activities. And those are things that you can 
say that you, so with assessment, with appropriate competency-based assessment, so a lot of assessments, a lot of feedback to show an arc of improvement and then an arc of proficiency with respect to the actual behavior that the practitioner will be in undertaking with the general public. So it's an entrustable professional activity. They can be trusted to do this with the public. And that is informed by a very broad assessment program. The content of the curriculum doesn't change. So the content that they'd like you to know in this document is absolutely fine. A lot of it's redundant. A lot of it is just headers and, and titles that are not instructive. You can strip this way down. But it, it also does note earlier on that they'd like a really strong assessment program, but there's no mention of how to generate assessment program. And there's no mention that it should ideally be a competency-based assessment. It's just assuming that assessment of students is there. It doesn't differentiate between assessment for learning, which would be a formative assessment, or assessment of learning, which would be summative, right? So you got to pass this test, otherwise you don't pass, uh, and with a certain standard mark. So the thing that I want to really say here is contact hours on its face, using contact hours to describe an educational process on its face means it lacks validity in today's world. The osteopathic profession, especially in America, is very aware of competency-based medical education and they are utilizing it. There are programs where they're trying to integrate it. And again, you need to understand that the content does not change. The assessment process changes. The length of the program may not change, but the assessment methods change. And the assess implementing good assessment practices is not an easy thing to do for current educators because they're used to just having people pass one or two tests. And it does take more time. It does take more effort. It takes a lot of training. And we'll discuss that in a subsequent podcast about how to build or the general outline of a good competency-based assessment program. But the WHO document, again, just based on using contact hours, loses face validity in today's world. It is more or less a moot document in the way that health professions education should be delivered as an upgraded standard across the world. You will see competency-based medical education in massage. You will see it in varying hands-on professions. You will not see, you do not see it yet in hands-on osteopathy or osteopathic manual practice. And then this goes through a bunch of other headlines. It's just a bunch of headlines. And then we get into the safety issues. Now, if you go through the safety issues in this document, it's actually really solid. So I don't need to go over that because I'm not going to critique it. The ability to identify contraindications and red flags, this document is very strong. I would actually suggest that anybody who is interested in education or interested in the profession or wants to talk about contraindications and safety issues, this is fantastic. This document's great. Then the end of the document is just a bunch of references and the names of the people who are involved. So fantastic. So I think I've made my point. More or less, the WHO document is not a standardized document. It is not a set of standards that is useful for the profession. It is not by a regulatory body in any way. It does not tell you how to build a curriculum to produce a competent practitioner. It doesn't include competency. It includes content hours, which it, on its face makes the document lose validity. So is the WHO document useful? It is useful as a first step in setting forth standards. Did it do a good job? It did not do a good job. It's just a bunch of it's just a bunch of redundant words. It doesn't tell you how to do it, doesn't tell you how to assess it. So what I'm going to aim to do in subsequent podcasts after I finish up here is bring forth how it would be useful to build an educational program. Now, saying this, I'm going to freely admit that this is a very niche topic, and this may not be all that interesting to many of you. However, it's going to be useful to many of you, whether you are a student, whether you're an educator, whether you're a professional, this is useful information. I suggest you pay attention to it and work with it, whether or not you like it, it's going to be useful for you. So see you next time.